All right, so starting off with our electromagnetic spectrum, we discussed this last time that when we are looking at an electromagnetic spectrum, um, the visible is only one tiny slice of a much wider range of different kinds of light. And so there are high energy types of light like gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet radiation that have short wavelengths, high frequencies, and high energies. So the reason these are damaging forms of radiation is because of their high energies. And then on the low energy, long wavelength, low frequency side, we have the infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. And it's maybe no surprise that the visible light um, is what we have evolved to see on Earth from our sun because that is one of the bands of the electromagnetic spectrum that is able to penetrate Earth's atmosphere and reach us here on the ground. There's another what we call window uh, out in the radio range. And so as a result, um, it's good for astronomers to have ground-based observatories for optical wavelengths and for radio wavelengths. But for other wavelengths, astronomers are not so lucky and cannot simply put observatories on the ground because those types of radiations get absorbed by molecules in our atmosphere. So for example, infrared radiation is absorbed by lots of different types of molecules, including water vapor, um, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrous oxides, all the uh, greenhouse gases absorb in the infrared range. And then the uh, gamma, x-ray, and ultraviolet are also um, absorbed in our atmosphere. And so for those wavelength ranges, astronomers have to put observatories in space. Uh, there are other reasons to put observatories in space, even in the visible range, for example. Uh, so the Hubble Space Telescope is a visible uh, range telescope, and the, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is kind of its successor, will also be a visible range. Those are also useful to put in space because the atmosphere not only blocks some types of light, but it also just smears out and makes um, images less crisp. So there are other advantages for space telescopes, but one of the big ones for specific ranges is the atmospheric absorption. All right, so just to check in on what we learned about the um, energy of different EM ranges, uh, which one of these listed uh, wavelength ranges has the highest energy. And I'm seeing the most answers for D that the X-ray has the highest energy of all the options listed here. Um, that's exactly right. But the uh, energy is not actually listed anywhere on this particular diagram. So what other information did you have to use in order to answer this question? And so those short wavelengths have the highest energy. So gamma rays are the highest, followed by X-ray and then ultraviolet, but I did not include gamma in the list. So in this case, the answer would be X-ray. All right, so um, how are these different wavelength ranges used by astronomers? Um, it turns out that they are complementary to each other. And by looking at a single object in many different wavelength ranges, we can see different parts of a entire structure. So in this example, this is the Crab Nebula. It's the remnant of an exploded star. And you can um, make out different details in the visible light than you can, for example, in the high energy X-ray range. So um, I'm going to give you a activity to kind of tease out some of the types of information that these different wavelength ranges provide. Um, your book has this big table of different sources, uh, typical astronomical sources of different types of radiation. Um, I don't think this is useful to try to memorize at this point, uh, but we'll come back to this and see how the different types of radiation are produced when we start to talk about how stars are born and um, how they die. 